collaboration with librarians, but also with the research <coughs> aspect of what uh, librarians teach um, in, uh, in accordance with our indicators and things like that. Um, so the first half of this presentation is our collaboration and piece, and the second half is going to be that research process and talking about that. Okay. All right. As a K-12 <laughs> library system, we have a philosophy that we approach our library work with. To me, what is really powerful and what I get up every morning and what gets me excited and puts my feet on the ground is the second sentence, that the librarian serves as an instructional partner with a classroom teacher. Okay? And then you can list all the things that we teach after that. I get excited by the idea that I can be an instructional partner with and I know that many of my colleagues also feel the same way. It is, like I said, my central role as a school librarian, our central role as school librarians, is to be your collaborative teaching partner. Okay, because there is no way that we can teach kids to be researchers and have them use that process and remember that process if we're only pinning it and being able to teach them once every eight days or maybe 40 minutes if we're lucky and everything goes well and it's not assembly day or an early out day or whatever else and we want to take it with our students we want to take this research process take all of these skills that we teach them from just this knowledge base having to be aware of it to it being put into practice okay that applying moving it on up that move taxonomy so as your collaborative partner I bring my expertise in material selection I bring um, my knowledge of teaching research method, methods to K through six kids. Um, you know, ideas that I have with integrated technology to support student learning, and then co-teaching that ethical use of information resources, teaching our kids that when they use a source of information, no matter what it is, it's digital or if it's traditional, a book, print, non-print, that they need to be doing a bibliography, that they need to cite that. And kindergarten students can cite it all the way up through some of you are probably citing your sources now if you're doing your graduate work. And I love this definition of what collaborative teaching is. I love it because it really does a great job of explaining that yes, there are gonna be times when we teach skills, we teach aspects together, but also there will be times when I will teach something and then the student will bring that back and then they'll apply it, okay? Or that you are teaching something and then it flows in the next. So it really is, you know, this mix of we're teaching together, but also we are teaching something separately that students then apply um, in that project that we're working on together. So when we say, okay, we're gonna be collaborative, or we're gonna teach a collaborative unit, we're gonna be planning together, here's what I come and what librarians come to the table with ready to do, okay? We bring our general knowledge of the curriculum. For that, we rely on those curriculum maps, okay? So if you are, for some reason, far off your curriculum map, please, you know, just kind of, you know, shoot some information to your librarian and say, hey, I know you use that curriculum map, but I just want you to know that we're kind of doing this instead, you know, and let us know so that we can help you or that we can just have some knowledge of it if we're looking ahead too and trying to come up with some ideas um, of when we could work together. We provide um, expertise and available information resources. We have a lot of really wonderful paid uh, databases and resources that we offer for everybody in our district. Um, and we wanna make sure that kids are getting the most out of those. Uh, we also <clears throat> have a wonderful print collection in all of our buildings. So we wanna make sure that we are using what we have available to them and that kids are reaching out for the things that are at hand. We also can do custom Google searches, things like that. Those are super easy and I love doing them. I think it really kind of gives kids better resource options than just saying, hey, go on Google and find it because they just don't have that skill set, not even up to sixth grade. It's just not as solid as we want it to be. We are uh, expertise in the research process and I'll talk more about what that looks like here in a little what bit. And then we provide ideas for technology integration, okay? Here's what we ask that you bring to the table as our collaborative a partner, okay? You're gonna bring your curriculum expertise. You are the expert in writing. You are the expert in social studies. You are the expert in 
X, Y, and Z, you name it. Okay? That's what we ask you to bring. Um, also, please, you know, bring those ideas for technology integration. And then you're going to always have probably a more intimate knowledge, a more up-to-date knowledge of individual student needs in your classroom and what they're going to need. You know, if Johnny needs, you know, some special time off by himself to process or something like that, you know, that's something to kind of know. Or if he needs to be retaught, we can divide that up. We can work in small groups. We can do those things together so that we can meet the needs of our kids. So how does this all kind of look when we bring it together? I'm going to pull up my third grade example. I'll go through this a little bit in some of the pieces here. When I sit down to collaborate with teachers, and librarians have shared this, they have this as well, they can use this, anybody can use this, I don't have a problem with that. So I put together this collaborative planning document just so we can keep track of what we're doing. Okay. So starting you know, on Monday, I, third grade, you just wait for the text. Together we chose a topic, you know, narrowing it down, not just kind of doing this carte blanche, write whatever you want. We said, no, we're gonna have them a list of health topics they can choose from, a list of, you know, environmental topics they can choose from. So students do get that personalized learning. They get some choice in what they're doing. Um, they can choose a pre-selected end product. So we chose four things that a student could do um, to kind of finish up, and we have some examples of what that looks like. They can then choose their audience. Okay. We have a graphic organizer that we created together to help students collect their notes and things. That's not my computer. Um, and then probably what is the most powerful in the document is just the, the layout of how all these different pieces, all the small little chunks, how they all fit together, and who's teaching what and when that's happening, and what data is happening. So if you look there, I've got this middle column here, and you'll see, you know, C, C plus L. If you're correct, and I know all of you are because you teach fourth grade, you can probably figure out the C is for classroom teacher and L is for librarian. So if you've got the C, it's you know the classroom teacher is doing that. So for the last two days, classroom teachers have been introducing persuasive writing with lots of mentor texts and things like that going forward. We also have a, um, today we're gonna go through topic selection, okay, we're gonna model. We've got some introducing those end products that we've done. And then it's gonna go through and go, go all the way to break. Starting on the 11th, that's when the classroom teacher really takes over because that's where the writing process starts. And that is not something, it's something I'm familiar with, but it's not something I'm an expert. So that's where you take over, and that's where they start doing all of those great things in writer's workshop or you know, whatever you're doing within Hoyt. What we have planned is that the students are gonna have a written final uh, persuasive piece um, by the 18th, by the day that we are, or, you know, by, before we leave for winter break. And then we're gonna roll that into when we come back in January, and they're gonna create a larger um, you know, presentation, a poster, a flyer. Uh, we have some other options that they can do, some more digital things, um, so that they can then present that out loud and then they can hit a speech indicator in January, okay? So it all kind of rolls into one. You might be thinking, well, I've heard all this before, this is project-based learning, and that's exactly what this is, okay? We've, we've planned a project-based learning opportunity for our students where we are all co-teaching together. So that's what that looks like. And the one thing I want to say before I get off this document is that you'll notice that, I mean, all of these are pretty consecutive days. You know, I'll be in my third grade classroom every day this, this week. And then I'll be in that. Room. <coughs> that works for me because at Hillside I'm there full time. Okay? Um, and I know that we have some hiccups and some challenges when it comes to librarians traveling. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit because it's a hiccup. It's a it's a challenge, but it's not impossible. So we'll talk about some ways to work around that if you have a traveling librarian or somebody. Okay. So like I was hinting at, let's talk about the reality of the situation. Because everything that I presented so far works really well if we're just living in this wonderful you know, world where it just all works out perfectly. Everybody's there full time, and the kids are great, and it's all ready to go. 
So let's talk about some reality situations, some of the things that we're actually facing. Okay. We know that collaborative teaching relationships, to some degree, are fairly new in our district when it comes to the classroom teacher and the librarian. When the schedule changed and the librarian schedule opened up and we had more of that flex scheduling, it was to start fostering these collaborative teaching opportunities. Okay? And simply because it's best practice. We know that from years of research. I did not put years of research into this presentation, but if you're interested in it, you can go out and seek it out. Colorado Report, Ken Haycock, those are some names that you're gonna wanna just Google. So, um, we know that it's more challenging, but it's far from impossible to plan units when a librarian works between buildings. Okay. Here are some of the known issues with that. We know that if you've got a librarian in your building for two days, they go somewhere else for two days, and they're in your building again for two days. We know that in some buildings, that first two days of the librarian is scheduled, that they are just scheduled full of classes, okay? And then we know that, that the next two days that they would be in that building, that's kind of that open time. Well, that eh, doesn't work so well. The most ideal situation is when you've got, if you think of the four days that your librarian is in your building for a cycle, that they have large chunks of time on each of those days. So they do have scheduled library classes on each day, but they also have those large chunks of time that they can come into their room. Okay. What works for me at my building is that my mornings are pretty much blocked off. Okay. I don't really teach in the mornings, except on three days and I have a late class that starts towards the end of the morning. But then my afternoons, you know, I'm teaching, I've got my regularly scheduled library classes. But the opportunity is that in that morning time is that I can come in and I can have that flex time and we can move things around. It may not be the time that maybe second grade is doing writing, but we can switch some things throughout the day. So maybe in the morning you do writing, but you move your math or whatever to the afternoon for those three days that we're talking about when we're collaboratively working together. So my advice to you is that if you're facing those challenges, if you're seeing those challenges, if you're just like, I just don't know when I can get my librarian in my building, that's a great chance to let's all sit down, let's have a conversation, let's see what we can do to make it work. Okay? And if you're having trouble, bring in your building administrators, bring in people. That's what, you know, we want to make this work. So let's try and figure something out. Okay, let's open ourselves up to be a little bit of flexible with how things are working. Let's try and find those workarounds. I guarantee you that at some point in time, this is just going to end in a colossal failure. Okay? You're going to have it all planned out going to be wonderful and you've made sure that you know you've got all your materials ready you've prepared your kids and then something's going to happen something unexpected and it's just going to fail and i've had a failure this year okay but we learn from it okay we adjust i take those things in and just like we teach our kids when you fail it's a great opportunity for learning so you take some things in and you move forward and you work on you know, making the next time better going to have success with this. I, I promise you, you will. Okay? You're going to have success in unexpected ways. And you're going to have success in ways that you're like, yeah, I planned on that because I'm not good. So, all right. And the last thing that I want to say is that we know that this is what's best for kids. Okay? We know. Like I said, there's 30 plus years of research that show that collaboration between your librarian and your classroom teacher, that it helps raise kids' achievement scores. Okay? And there's no reason why you should have to be in there alone struggling with research process with your kids when you've got a librarian that is there and ready to help you and is able to. Okay? It's just a matter of planning well in ahead, well in advance, and putting those pieces together. My third grade unit that I started, we started planning that in September. You know, we didn't meet every week, but we started planning then. We planted the seeds and we were working towards this. We met together, we talked. We that's the kind of planning that needs to take place in order for things to kind of be set up and ready to go. So, you know, I'm really excited about, you know, the work that I'm doing in my building um, starting this week. And so we'll see how it all goes. It could be a colossal failure. I don't know, but we'll find out. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the research process. So one of the things that we do as librarian is that, of course, we are trying to instill a process in our kids for how can they approach research. 
you're going to find that all research processes basically boil down to something pretty simple and really to three steps. It doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it Super 3, you can call it Joe's best research practice, whatever you want to do, okay? But basically what it boils down to is plan, do, review. So, in that step one, that planning stage, we're asking kids to kind of, you know, take a look at three separate areas and get themselves prepared. When you're planning, you're not just jumping right in. And the planning doesn't even have to be something that takes more than a few moments, okay? So, we're asking kids, okay, what are they supposed to do? That's when we make sure that kids get the rubric, they get a checklist, we go over we um, talk about, you know, question two, we talk about what are some possible places that I can look for information, okay? Kind of doing just an overview. And then what do I want it to look like when I'm done? We show them those end products, give them that goal. Okay, these are things probably that you're already doing, okay? But it's just broken down, okay? Right, and having kids actually stop and think and have that end uh, product, that end goal, having sort of that 10,000 foot view of the research process in their mind before we step into step two, which is that doing stage. This is the longest stage. This is where all the action happens. When we think of research, this is typically some of the things, the stage that, that we our brains automatically jump into. Okay? Right. This is where students are actively choosing their books, they're choosing their websites, they're looking at other possible sources of information. They have to find those things. Encourage them to stop and actually find them before you, they start drawing information from them. We want kids choosing from the best things that are on the internet, not just whatever pops up first on their Google page, okay? That's where a custom Google search can be helpful. The librarians, we teach evaluation skills at certain grade levels, we start putting that in there. So let's have that conversation and let's plan that together, okay? These kids need to ask questions, they take notes, they um, read, okay, they're processing that. I need to use the information I find to create something. This is where they're writing, okay? Now, you're gonna find that all of those, in crafting nonfiction, those lessons that are there, that are research, that's where those fit. They fit in this stage. You have several lessons in there about taking notes and, you know, I saw the, the RAND strategy was, was mentioned today, things like that. Those things fit here, okay? And so I have a copy of Crafting Nonfiction for Intermediate Grades. Not all librarians, in fact, I may be the only librarian that has a copy because somebody had an extra in my building, but go ahead and share that <coughs> with your librarian and show them, hey, here's all this research stuff that's in our Hoyt writing. Can you help me incorporate that in there, okay? And then the last stage is the review. And I, this is, I mean, the doing stage is where the meat is, but the review stage is where some reflection happens, and it's probably the one that I enjoy the most, okay? So this is all done before they hand in their final product to you for that final grade, okay? So students ask themselves, you know, three really important questions. I do what I'm supposed to do. Okay. Did I cover all my bases? Go through that checklist one more time. Go through that rubric, kind of mark some things off. Did I do it? Did I get it all done? I love question two. Am I proud of what I've done? Okay. I love that because it puts some things back on the student and says, okay. <coughs> we want our students to feel pride in what they do because we know that that's probably going to increase the quality of their work. Right? Now, if the answer to any of these questions, oh, I'm sorry, and the last one is there something else I should say or I should do before I say it done, okay? If the answer to these are no and we've gotten through all this and we've gotten Susie through writing her rough draft and now putting this final draft and we're asking to do this now, and then Susie goes, oh, you know what? I'm not really proud of this and I miss doing this and blah, blah, blah. Well, sorry, Susie, we're gonna keep this reflection and we're gonna apply that next time, but we're gonna keep moving forward, okay? because um, everything has to end, otherwise this could be a never-ending ordeal. <clears throat> so give those students an opportunity to do their own personal reflection or reflecting with a partner so that they can keep those notes and then they can apply that the next time that they are working on something. Okay. And I just wanted to
to say thank you for letting me and being such a great audience. Um, what I would ask.